Hello, U.S. History students, and welcome to Unit 3, Lesson 3, The Outbreak of World War I. The outbreak of World War I has four main causes, and that's how I want you to remember it. It's what we call a mnemonic device. It's a, a way to help you remember information. So each letter in Maine represents one of the causes. The first one is militarism. When you think militarism, think military, armed forces, and a navy. And it's a policy to maintain a large military that's ready to go for war. The A is alliances. These are friendships between countries or agreements between countries that if one country attacks them, that their friends are going to come help them out. So it's an agreement between two or more nations to cooperate in achieving a common goal and to aid each other if attacked. There are two sets of allies in World War I. The first one is the Triple Entente, also known as the Allied Powers, and they are Great Britain, France, Russia, and eventually the United States. The other side is, I guess you could say, the bad guys in the war from a U.S.-centric perspective. And they are the Triple Alliance or the Central Powers, and that is Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy for a little while. The I is imperialism, and we've been talking about imperialism in Lessons 3.1 and 3.2, and imperialism is when a bigger nation takes over a smaller nation for the purpose of raw materials and new markets. And at this point in time, that's how a country becomes a world power, is by taking over smaller countries. The more territories you have, the bigger and badder the country is. The N is nationalism. This is a, basically the same thing as patriotism. Loyalty to a nation that share common homeland, history, or desire for sovereignty. And sovereignty is a country's right to self-govern, or pick how they govern. And those are your four main causes of World War I that I want you to remember. From 1914 to 1919, World War I erupts in Europe. And the reason it says 1919 is because that is when the Treaty of Versailles is signed. In order to end a war, you must have a treaty, which is a document that contains the agreement for ending the war. The fighting in World War I actually ends in 1918. So if you need to know what years World War I was fought, please remember 1914 to 1918. But within this time period, the Great War, or the War to End All Wars, begins as a result of competition over imperial territories, country trying to take over territories for raw materials and new markets. They also build up really powerful and industrial navies. And the larger the navies and the militaries get, the more of a threat they are to the countries that are not necessarily their friend. European rivalries lead to two military alliances that really threaten to draw European nations into war. The blue on our map here is the Triple Entente, or the Allied Powers, and this is England, France, and Russia. In 1917, Russia leaves. They're fighting their own civil war within their own country, and the United States joins. So the United States joins on behalf of the Triple Entente. The red are Austria, Hungary, Italy, and Germany, and they form the Triple Alliance. These, from a U.S.-centric perspective, are the bad guys. So, before the war even starts, there are alliances happening. And think of an alliance as a friendship between countries where they agree, if this country over here attacks me, then you're going to come to my aid. You're going to help me out. And so let's take a look at a few of the alliances prior to World War I and how they happen. 
Let's look at the Triple Entente first, which are our blue countries on the right. France and Great Britain, even though they've been friends for a really long time, in 1904, they sign a treaty. So they have a document that says, if you get attacked, I'm going to come help you out. Three years later, in 1907, Great Britain and Russia do the same thing. They sign a treaty that says, if you get attacked, I will come help you out. Going back even farther than that, France and Russia just have like a verbal agreement. It's not written down. It's just an agreement between the two countries that if something happens, they're going to come to each other's aid. On the Triple Alliance side, the alliances go back a lot farther. So Germany and Austria-Hungary have been friends since 1879. Germany and Italy have been friends since 1882. Austria-Hungary and Italy, same year, 1882. And then in 1914, Germany makes friends with the Ottoman Empire, which is the largest and oldest empire in the world at that point. And then Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Russia agree to help out Serbia and Bulgaria respectively, which are in the Balkans. And this is going to lead to the spark. So we see four main causes, militarism, imperialism, alliances, and nationalism. But there's always a spark, something just crazy and outrageous that ends up starting the war. And in this case, we see rivalries over militarism and imperialism really start increasing. We also see nationalism, pride in one's country and one's, you know, nationality and ethnicity really begin to increase amongst European powers. All of this is going to lead to that spark, and that spark happens in a region called the Balkans. And this is a region right here on our map where that bomb is located. So in 1914, the Bosnians and the Serbians, which are two ethnic groups, decide that they really would like to have land in the region that Austria-Hungary contains. They control the region. And at this point... The Bosnians believe it belongs to them and they want to make their own country. The Serbians also believe that it belongs to them. And in 1914, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary, who is the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, so he's part of their royal family, goes with his wife and they go to a place called Sarajevo, which is in modern-day Bosnia. And they're on their way to go to a meeting. And while they were in their open car, as you can see in the artist's rendering, this gentleman jumps out of the crowd and he's a member of this Serbian terrorist organization called the Black Hand. And he throws a bomb at their car. The bomb bounces off the car and land, lands under the next car in the motorcade, which is like a group of cars that are going to the same place. So the car with the Archduke in it, they speed away, and they get to the town hall. They have their meeting, and on the way back to where they were going, the car takes a wrong turn. It goes somewhere where it hadn't planned to go. And another assassin of the same group, the Black Hands, named Gavrilo Princip, happens to find himself right next to the car. So he pulls out his gun and he fires twice. One shot hits the Archduke, the other hits his wife Sophie, and both are dead. Um, at that point, because Austria-Hungary has agreed to help out the Bosnians and the Russians have agreed to help out the Serbians. The Austro-Hungarians also, because they just killed the heir to their throne, 
go in and they start to fight Serbia. Well, Serbia is allied with Russia, so Russia comes in to help them out. And this is the spark that begins the war. Because of that extreme nationalism, that extreme belief in a tie to that region, all of this happens, all of this unfolds, and it leads to the war starting. Germany and Austria-Hungary were then joined by Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire. And then England, France, and Russia become the Allied powers. And they are eventually joined by the United States and many other countries in the world. As you can see from this map, there's way more Allied countries than there are Central Powers. While Germany, Austria, Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria have a few friends, they have some in the South Pacific, and they've got a few friends in Africa, more countries in the world go against them than for them. Here's a little bit different graphic to give you a better idea. So the central powers are Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria, Germany, and the Ottoman Empire. The Allied powers are Australia, Belgium, British colonies, so Britain and their colonies, Canada, Newfoundland, France, French North Africa, French colonies, Great Britain, Greece, India, Italy. Funny, we just saw that as an ally to Germany. Funny story with Italy, they're allied with Germany Friends from way back. But about a year after the war starts, the war starts in 1914. In 1915, Italy makes a top secret alliance with Great Britain and they switch sides. So now they're against Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, Germany, and the Ottoman Empire. That's going to be really important when we start to sign the treaty to end the war. But back to the Allies. We also have Japan and Montenegro and New Zealand, Portugal, Romania, Russia, Serbia, South Africa, and the United States. So as you can see, there's a really long list of countries that help out Great Britain, France, and Russia, including the United States eventually. So the outbreak of World War I in 1914 is a real test for America's new foreign policy. America's just a tiny little baby imperialist country. We've just started gaining territories in 1898-99, and we just have control over those. And because of that reason... Americans don't want to get involved. They want to remain neutral. We're just kind of figuring out where we stand as a world power and don't really want to get involved in a major European conflict such as the Great War. The people of the United States, drawn from many nations and chiefly from the nations now at war, it is natural and inevitable that there should be sympathy with regard to circumstances of the conflict. Every man who really loves America will act and speak in the true spirit of neutrality. The United States must be neutral in fact as well as name during these days that are to try men's souls. This is an excerpt from a speech that Woodrow Wilson made in 1914 proclaiming America's neutrality saying we are not going to get involved, you know, even though we have cultural ties to some of the countries involved, because we are a country of many immigrants, we are not going to stand by and get involved. We're going to stay out of it. Despite efforts by Wilson to stay out of it, the United States does join World War I, and the reason that they do this is twofold. Americans were absolutely outraged by what the Germans were doing. And 
They felt like the Germans were attacking the U.S., which isn't wrong. Americans were outraged at first because of Germans' unrestricted submarine war warfare attacks on regular passenger ships. Now, while we do not officially get involved yet, we are going to help our friends because we do have alliances with Great Britain and France. So we're not going to get involved. We're not going to send troops so much, but we will send supplies. We can do that. We're going to help our friends that way. But at this point in time, we don't have airplanes that fly from the United States to Great Britain. There is no transatlantic flight. So the only way to really get supplies over there is by ship. And so the Germans have this newfangled invention called the submarine, which has been around for a little bit at that point, but it's really used for the first time in major warfare in World War I. And so they start going around in the Atlantic and sinking any ship that they think is carrying supplies for their enemies. Most of these ships are passenger liners. Um, think like the Titanic, a ship with civilians. And what really gets Americans' attention is the sinking of the Lusitania. The Lusitania is a British passenger liner that is carrying American citizens. And it's sunk by a torpedo off the coast of Ireland. And they killed 1,260 people. About 127 of those are American civilians. And so this really angers Americans to the point where they're kind of getting to the point where they're, they're okay maybe with war, but not really yet. Even more outrage comes when news of the Zimmerman telegram starts being posted in all the newspapers. And basically what happens with this is Germany is looking for any possible way to attack the United States. So they send a telegram, which is how they would communicate back then, to Mexico. And they're offering Mexico, hey, if you help us out and you let us invade the United States through the southern border, if we win, we'll give you all the land that you lost in the Mexican-American War. So that's pretty much giving them Arizona, New Mexico, and California back. And here's a little bit of what they said. We intend to begin the 1st of February unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor, in spite of this, to keep the United States of America neutral. In the event that this not succeed, we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together, generous financial support and understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territories of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The settlement in detail is left to you. You will inform the president of both most secretly as soon as the outbreak of war with the United States of America is certain and add the suggestion that he should, on his own initiative, invite Japan to immediate adherence and at the same time mediate between Japan and ourselves. So what he's, what Germany is basically saying is, at this point we know America's mad at us, we know this is going to happen, so... Like, we'll give you Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona back if you help us out and we win. Well, Mexico never gets it. The British intercept the telegram, and they, being our friends, let us know that Germany's talking about us behind our back, and this is what they plan to do. Of course, it's posted in all the newspapers, and Americans are absolutely furious. They're so angry. At that point, America has been neutral from 1914 to 1917. But in April of 1917, after sinking a bunch of ships with Americans, 
And now, going behind America's back and trying to make an alliance, we're done. In order to begin a war, the president has to go to Congress. So Woodrow Wilson petitions Congress and says, look, not only have they sunk American ships without warning, American lives are lost, but now they're trying to make secret alliances. It's time to get involved. And so President Woodrow Wilson promises to make the world safe for democracy by helping out. And Congress does say okay, and Congress declares war in April of 1917 on the Central Powers. And that is where we will stop for Unit 3, Lesson 3. See you back here for Unit 3, Lesson 4, and I hope that you have a great day.